I never imagined I'd be living out in the middle of nowhere, much less in a rundown old farmhouse I found on the cheap. But I had wanted a fresh start, and when I inherited a little money after my dad died, getting out of the city seemed like the perfect plan. The past year had been hard on me, losing dad, breaking up with my longtime girlfriend, and getting laid off all within a few months of each other left me feeling lost and alone. The grief counselor I had been seeing told me a change of scenery could help shift my perspective. So on a whim, I decided to search for houses in rural areas outside the city. That's how I stumbled upon the property listing for the Rosewood Farm Estate. The photos showed an aged but stately farmhouse set on 20 acres of wooded land about 45 minutes outside the city limits. It had originally caught my eye due to the cheap price tag, way below market value. The place was certainly outdated, with floral wallpaper and decades-old appliances, but it had potential. I fell in love with the wraparound porch looking out over the lush forest behind the house. It seemed like an enchanting place to have a fresh start. The cheap price was due to the recent death of the previous elderly owner, and the seller was an out-of-state relative just wanting a fast sale, so I jumped on it. When I made the drive out to see the property for the first time, the place seemed even more charming than the photos. The ambiance of the forest around it was incredible. Inside, the place was musty but quaint, with a classic farmhouse layout and quirky little details. I started imagining myself living there, sipping tea on the porch while looking out at the autumn leaves. Maybe getting a cat or two, just enjoying the solitude and taking long walks through those amazing woods, it felt meant to be. It took about a month between closing on the place, packing up my tiny apartment, and officially moving in. The first week was mainly unpacking, trying to clean a quarter century's worth of dust and spiders out of the corners, and making endless hardware store trips for odds and ends. I didn't mind, though. I almost enjoyed making the place slowly become more my own. I slept on an inflatable mattress in what was now my bedroom while hunting Craigslist for cheap secondhand furniture. I even liked the creaks and groans of the old house settling at night. It felt comforting somehow. By the eighth night, died. I had finally cleared enough clutter out of what would be my study to set up my laptop and desk. The musty room still needed a lot more work, but just having a space to write and chill with music or podcasts felt huge. Late that night, I found myself gazing out the study's window into the darkness of the woods beyond. The moonlight made the trees look like jagged cutouts against the black sky. As a breeze passed, the entire forest swayed in hypnotic unison. It was the first time I paused to consider how vastly the acres of untamed wilderness dwarfed my house. I suddenly wondered what was even out there. The next morning, I decided to skip unpacking for a chance to explore my new backyard forest. The autumn chill bit through my light sweater as I wandered slowly into the tree line. My boots crunched satisfyingly through a carpet of orange and brown leaves. It felt straight out of a fairy tale, with golden beams of sunlight slicing the canopy overhead and tiny birds flitting to and fro. Squirrels and chipmunks scattered at my approach. The light smell of moss and damp earth surrounded me. I weaved between the towering oaks and maples without any clear direction or purpose. I just wanted to walk and admire it all. Before I knew it, an hour had passed, just wandering aimlessly through the woods. I probably should have paid more attention to where I was headed in case I got lost, but I could still catch glimpses of the house through the trees, so I knew I was fine. When a small clearing opened up ahead, I stepped into it, taking in the view. It felt like a little secret sanctuary, an island of vibrant green grass surrounded by crimson and amber leaves. I crossed the tiny field, planning to complete a loop back to the yard, but on the far side, I froze. Half hidden under a layer of soggy leaves and forest debris was what looked like the entrance to an old tunnel ringed in crumbling brick. Strange. I didn't recall seeing this on any property maps when I'd purchased the place. I moved closer, fascinated. Kneeling down and brushing plant debris aside revealed a narrow passageway lined with concrete, leading down under the ground at an angle. Just inside, I could make out a rusted iron rung ladder descending further into darkness. My heart quickened with curiosity, wondering where this bizarre tunnel led. Glancing at my phone showed no service this deep in the woods to call the cellar and ask. The tunnel clearly seemed man-made, though, so maybe it had historical value. Or what if it was something more sensitive, like Cold War infrastructure? 
My mind raced, and I knew I had to at least peek inside. Pulling out my phone's flashlight, I carefully stepped over the eroded entrance. My boots echoed down the concrete tube as I placed them on the first few rungs of the ladder, straining to see where it led. A nervous exhilaration tingled through me. Leaning further in, a waft of cold, stale air hit my face from below. Just a quick look, I told myself, just to satisfy my curiosity of whatever this mysterious tunnel was. Taking a deep breath, I descended into the darkness. Using my phone's flashlight, I followed the tunnel further underground. The ladder descends at least 20 more feet at a steep incline before opening into a larger concrete room. Stepping down from the last rung, I shine my light around, taking it all in. The underground bunker looks straight out of a Cold War thriller movie set. Harsh concrete walls curve up to meet a low ceiling with exposed pipes and vents. Rows of shelves still hold dusty boxes and large jugs marked with faded chemical names. One wall has floor-to-ceiling stacks of shrink-wrapped pallets that look like food ration bundles from some apocalypse prepper. I walk slowly along the shelves, examining containers and canisters, but having no clue what half this stuff really is. Was someone running a lab down here at some point? Or maybe it was meant as a fallout shelter during nuclear tensions with the Soviets. A thick layer of dust covers everything, though, hinting that no one has been down here in ages. I snap some photos on my phone, but of course, there's still no service to send them to anyone. Continuing my exploration down the rows, I enter into what looks like an old common area or break room, filled with simple cots and tables. Dusty books and magazines litter some of the surfaces, looking straight out of another era. A quick glance at a yellowed newspaper headline confirms at least parts of this bunker date back to the mid-1960s. Crazy to think this time capsule has just been sitting forgotten under the woods this whole time. Makes me wonder what else might still be hidden down other tunnels. I set my phone on a table to cast some ambient light around the room, then move to try opening one of the large metal lockers along the wall. The latch squeals from decades of disuse as I pry it open. Inside sits neatly folded sets of heavy canvas clothes that look vaguely military, but with no insignia or name tags. Rifling through the piles uncovers no other clues of the bunker's original purpose. Hopefully, there are more clues deeper within. Closing up that locker, I search for what section to explore next. Some open doorways at the far side of the room catch my eye. That way seems to lead even deeper into the underground maze. I flick my flashlight beam over, but the darkness gives no hint to what might lie beyond that threshold. An uneasy tightness forms in my chest. Maybe wandering into those unlit corridors alone isn't the smartest plan. Then again... When will I ever get a chance to freely poke around a time capsule bunker under my own backyard again? Curiosity pushes me onwards. My footsteps echo off the concrete, sounding abnormally loud as I cross the large common space toward the doorway. Passing the last set of cots, my boot catches a half-unfolded blanket draped between the bed frames. I stumble, trying not to faceplant, as I kick loose from the woven snare. My elbow crashes hard into a small shelving cart beside me in an effort to stay upright. The metal racks topple to the floor with a tremendous clatter amplified by the concrete walls around me. I wince as the echoes of the crash fade back to silence. A nervous embarrassment washes over me and I find myself whispering, sorry, to no one, as if I was caught snooping here. I let out an awkward little laugh at myself as I righted the fallen cart, making sure I didn't break anything before gently setting it back into place. No harm done, just gotta watch my step down here. Collecting my phone light again, I continue making my way toward the inner doorway across the room. As I step through the threshold into the dark corridor beyond, the piercing crash echoes back through the rooms again, repeating endlessly from every direction until dissipating once more. The sheer emptiness in this place lets even the smallest disruption reverberate for ages. As the last distorted echoes fade off down the pitch passages, a sinking discomfort settles into my chest. I glance back over my shoulder towards the way I had entered. The depths now seem menacing, like a lurking presence. Had exploring this abandoned bunker alone really been such a brilliant idea? That persistent reverberation didn't sound as innocuous anymore, now almost mimicking distant footsteps chasing me down into this underground maze. A nervous impulse presses me to turn back, to leave this place undisturbed with its mysteries intact before something happens. I force an embarrassed laugh at myself yet again, annoyed that I'm letting simple acoustic effects rattle me, 
It's all just empty halls and shadows down here. Once I've satisfied my curiosity a little more, I can follow my own echo trail right back out. Taking a deep breath, I raise my flashlight and proceed cautiously down the hall, peering into each new room or storage area as I pass. Many contain similar dusty shelves and lockers like the first spaces, while others seem more actively ransacked. One appears to have been a security command post once, judging by the gutted control panels and surveillance screens. Evidence is mounting that military or government personnel definitely utilized this bunker extensively at some point. I snap more photos of the dated equipment, though that they don't help yield more specific clues about the actual former purpose or current ownership of this place. At a T split in the passage, I randomly turn right, following the corridor until I arrive at another large chamber that may have served as barracks or dorms once. Inside is a grid of more basic cots, alongside battered foot lockers at the end of each bed. I set down my phone again, casting a hub of light amid the eight empty beds so I could poke through the storage chests. Most contain a few mundane personal artifacts like worn socks, water-stained books, and a deck of cards, but no ID tags or anything to put names to those who stayed here. One trunk near the back does house what looks like a folder of paperwork. Taking it to the nearest cot under the light, I gently peel open the crumbling file. Diagrams of pneumatic chemistry equipment and molecular structures fill each curled page. Scattered sentences refer to observational studies of the effects of some compound labeled MBX-893, whatever that implies. Coming across redacted names and several top-secret stamps leaves me even more confused, but also increasingly wary about blatantly nosing through potentially classified documents down here. A smaller side office branches off from the open barracks, so I migrate there next, locating a heavy desktop phone that I lift to check for a dial tone. Of course, the line is long dead, if it ever even connected to the outside world. Rifling the drawers reveals an eclectic collection of confiscated goods like switchblades, a flask, and what may be human molars in a small jar. But again, no helpful ID of whose bizarre collection this was. My main light starts to gently flicker then, signaling my phone battery is running low after an hour below ground. A fresh trickle of unease goes down my spine. No other visible light sources exist down here should mine fail completely. Outside, what pale beam might filter through from the surface exit so far back? I need to wrap this up soon and get above ground before I'm plunged into darkness. Crossing back through the maze of rooms and corridors, I decide exploring just one more chamber won't hurt, choosing another partially caved-in storage bay. Carefully climbing past the fallen beams and debris blocking most of the shelving, I brush the dust from some unbroken bottles to read their peeling labels but the chemical names offer no more hints about this place than anything else I've found so far. My impatience for answers grows as I move deeper into the room, shoving stacks of moldy cardboard boxes aside. Passing the small dust cloud reveals the back corner filled with larger items covered under thick canvas tarps. Now, we're getting somewhere. These could be vehicles, machines, or anything more obviously informative than endless shelves of anonymous crates that all look frustratingly identical. Striding over, I yank back the corner of the nearest tarp to reveal the parameters of what appears to be mechanical equipment. Did they have some kind of backup generator system running down here? Straining for a better grip on the stiff canvas, I try peeling it back further when my overzealous tugging overbalances a small pile. I leap aside just as the heavy stack crashes over. The sound thunders through the concrete chamber like a grenade blast. My heart hammers as I stand frozen for a long few seconds, listening to the grating echoes distort then fade away. A nervous laugh escapes me yet again. Guess I'm being overly jumpy, not used to having my own noises echo back so harshly, playing tricks in this sensory-deprived place. I just need to rein in the careless impulse before I knock something more dangerous over onto myself. I move to start recovering the equipment when the echoes return, cascading from every direction to converge back upon me like ripples in a vast subterranean pond. But this repeat distortion sounds different, more random and arrhythmic than my initial impact. My skin prickles as my instincts try to process the out-of-place noise my conscious brain hasn't caught up on yet. Finally, it hits me. Among the sounds are the echoes of, of something else moving in this underground space. My lungs turn to ice as I scan the darkness pressing in around me. Those extra echoes sounded almost like footsteps somewhere in the distance, as if something else had been startled 
by my noisy disruption and is now on the move. But that would mean... My eyes dart towards the room's doorway, just as a muffled scraping comes from the corridor shadows. Something is definitely out there. Maybe a smaller animal took shelter down here from the surface. But why haven't I noticed rats or bats or anything else living in an abandoned bunker until the moment I make a racket? I inch sideways, groping for my swaying flashlight beam. My stomach drops, spotting how dangerously dim the light has faded. Dread churns through me at being trapped in darkness with whatever else skulks in this concrete catacomb, especially if that something seems more unsettled by my trespassing than afraid itself. The scrapes sound again down the hall, perhaps circling nearer. My chest tightens until each breath strains against the panic rising up my throat. Cold logic battles my racing imagination over what I've actually seen evidence of so far versus what ghastly possibilities my adrenaline-soaked mind can conjure up out of gnawing fear and blind belief. Maybe some malnourished feral hound went wild after being abandoned down here ages ago. Though what kind of animal could physically survive this long and subterranean isolation? A muffled impact against something solid echoes from the passageway, followed by a hair-raising grating noise fading into the distance again. Okay, yeah, no more hypothetical excuses. Something with mass is definitely moving around out there reacting to my presence. My hands tremble around the flashlight, willing it to shine brighter through this never-ending tension. I sweep the feeble beam towards the room's opening just as a gut-churning metallic screech shrieks down the hallway. A primal spike of pure terror shoots through me at the sheer wrongness of the sound no earthly creature could or should make. The implied thing moves closer, its scrape clicks warping in and out of a nerve-shredding randomness no pack animal could mimic. This place is not abandoned. Something feral and unfathomable is in this bunker too, and I've trespassed obliviously into its domain, escaping as my only defense now. I abandon the equipment and scramble back over the debris, no longer caring for stealth or secrecy. Navigating the ruins by memory and touch, I reach the room's opening just as my light flickers and then finally dies, submerging me in the void. Blind instinct takes over as I race through the corridors, one hand tracing along the wall, desperate to outrun the thing somewhere behind me in the darkness. Each shuffling of its movement tears all rational thought away. Deafening heartbeats fill my ears, drowning out any other sense. Filtered through gripping panic, the creature's erratic movement almost resembles the frantic scrabbling of something trying to escape from an even greater threat that has my scent now. Rounding the last corner, I barrel towards where I pray the exit ladder lies waiting. Behind me echo the alien footsteps of something no longer bothering to hide its pursuit. Then, ten feet from freedom suddenly, my shoulder slams brutally into an unseen shelf, sending me crashing to the floor as what's left of my rational mind recognizes I've misjudged the distance in blindness. New instinct takes over as I curl into a quivering ball rather than stagger up to flee again. Maybe it will lose track of me for precious seconds if I hold utterly still and noiseless. Either way, escaping is impossible when I'll only run into more debris before ever finding the way out. Fighting back is equally hopeless. Now, cowering in petrified silence is my only pathetic defense against the horror shuffling ever nearer through the dark. Each dragging rasp of its irregular walk strips further layers of courage away until nothing remains except weeping, primordial terror. Eons seem to pass, measured in pounding heartbeats. My sanity hangs by a thread, praying it loses interest, until a deafening crash blasts through the blackness as something massive topples nearby. A howl, unlike any animal, tears from my lungs. I've never made a noise like that in my life. My heart pounds as I hear heavy footsteps approaching. Nothing about the pattern suggests normal human motion. Survival alarms blare in my brain, demanding I hide from whatever this thing is. I duck behind some shelves just as a shape emerges from the pooling darkness. Crouched low between the cold metal racks, I contain my breathing praying my scent or noise goes unnoticed. The heavy steps traverse past my hiding place, accompanied by a vicious dragging hiss against the floor. When the shuffling mass of the creature at last passes into my sightline between the shelves, the visual reality proves infinitely worse than speculation. Covered in translucent skin, slick with oozing slime, it reveals contorted muscles flexing strangely beneath. It towers twice my height, 
hunched forward under a cloak of stringy hair, obscuring all facial features save a gaping mouth lined with black teeth. Skinny arms sprout extra joints, ending in curving claws that scrape with each step. Most disturbing of all, sunken deep under that greasy veil of hair, lie two large, smooth expanses of flesh where eyes should reside. No pupils, lids, or sockets are to be seen, just wide patches of tissue surrounded by scars. Blind, it's totally blind, yet somehow still keenly tracking my presence only by scent and sound. Disgust and horror root me in place as the creature creeps past. When at last the creatures move out of view down the next corridor, I huddle gasping behind the shelves, struggling to reconcile reality with what I've just seen. The minutes crawl by, straining to detect any hint over my own wheezing breath, it still lingers nearby, but only void answers. Relief battles churning nausea. I've survived undetected, but for how long? I'm outmatched in strength and sensory ability underground. My only path is escape. I pull out my phone to orient towards the surface, but no signal or GPS exists this deep in the bunker. Had I even retained enough mental faculties to recall the twisting route back to the entrance ladder anyway? Without breadcrumbs or guiding light, I'd only exile myself to slower doom, starving blindly in the dark once batteries died. Creeping slowly from my hiding place on quivering legs, I begin carefully retracing my original path inwards, praying echolocation doesn't betray my movements again, counting each footstep and breath to mark fleeting seconds. My ears strain so acutely, awaiting whispers of scuttling claws that I scarcely register the deadening silence surrounding me now. No more than a cautious handful of strides bring me parallel the side tunnel, veering off towards the bunker's back-end maintenance areas, regions clearly still walked by that creature which is when a snarl shatters the corridor behind me. The creature has found me. Heavy footsteps rush my way. It knows I'm here now. There is nowhere to hide. I sprint away as the creature bursts from the shadows, racing after me with startling speed. Its disjointed limbs flail wildly to accelerate the misshapen body, barreling down the passage towards me. My pounding heart drowns out the sound of my feet as I race down the corridor. Adrenaline floods my muscles, hurtling me forward as fast as desperation allows me. Pursuit echoes, unrelenting behind, slavering grunts and claws finding traction against the concrete. The creature knows each twist of this place while I'm frantically guessing each turn, trying to recall the correct path upward. Rounding a sharp bend, my shoulder slams into the bricked ruins of a caved-in vault. Rebar tangles through the rubble, snagging clothes in my scramble over the debris. I gasp, struggling not to rip my hands to shreds prying free from the barbs. Tearing loose from the steel trap, I hurtle onward through the network of storage bays and maintenance rooms. The exit ladder must be somewhere ahead through the emergency lights, though the deeper I flee into the complex, the fainter those red beacons shine. Blackness waits to swallow any who wander down here, especially with death itself howling for my blood-only heartbeats behind. I risk a panicked glance back at the sound of toppling shelving, spotting a pale, sinuous shape writhing over the obstacles. Our race has carried me ahead for the moment, but such obstacles barely slow the creature's relentless pursuit. Its eyeless face undulates, sniffing voraciously to reacquire lost scent. Inside the sagging cowl of hair, jaws unclasp impossibly wide, as if to swallow prey whole once within reach. My gaze whips forward just in time to swerve left, saving my skull as the passage ends abruptly at a collapsed tunnel. Ancient wood planks bar further access, but a narrow gap promises safer passage beyond. I squeeze through without hesitation, leaving flesh and cloth behind on jagged edges. No time for pain while the Reaper itself claws after me. I spill awkwardly into the next hall, fighting not to fall face first from the unbalanced landing. Behind, a loud sound announces the monster is through plowing heedless past the wooden spears. I spring to my feet and bolt on. Each frantic pump of limbs stretches distance again, but now bright emergency lamps directly ahead signal my nearing freedom. The exit. That glow taunts just one chamber farther down at the hall's end. Racing the last yards, I leap through crumbled concrete barriers, only for softwood to disintegrate underfoot. My body plunges into darkness, hands snatching the splintered ledge as legs kick terrified emptiness. I clench every fiber to keep hold of this latest trap, 
squinting down past my dangling heels, reveals a 20-foot pit directly under the tunnel entrance. Painfully hoisting up again, my eyes meet the glow of daylight from above. Mere steps would have carried me to salvation before the wood walkway gave out. I twist my fingers into holds and heave my body left onto firmer wood planks set into the curving wall. Inches below, a clawed hand slashes the space my head just vacated. I recoil from needle tips, swiping against my hair, rolling clear along the ledge. Behind me, boards crack, then splinter loudly under the weight of the creature, pulling itself fully over the brink. I throw a terrified glance back at the sound. In the shadows beyond the pit, a pale shape grows closer. In that suspended second, I know finally the true crushing despair of prey. That ultimate resignation as monstrous jaws inexorably close the final distance. Utterly overwhelmed by the shadow falling towards me, a whimper escapes my seizing throat. I cannot win and I cannot fight, yet still must choose the form of my ending. The only direction left to me is up or down. In the sacrifice of calculated odds, I choose down, launching off the ledge just as skeletal claws whisper past my nape. For one glorious instant, I believe I've slipped fate's snare, soaring untouchable out into the freedom of the central shaft, my silhouette framed against dull light above. Then the triumph pitches into horror, watching the creature gather itself to spring from the ledge, arms coiling to snatch me from the air halfway down. But salvation takes the form of catastrophe. Old fixtures still bracketing the central tunnel choose that precise moment to give. Directly overhead, the rusted remains of a ventilation shaft tear loose, plunging straight towards me. The force of that impact obliterates decades-old supports, left decaying after this complex was initially abandoned. A deafening cascade launches behind my heels as the rim of the pit and exit ledge shear completely away. Tons of concrete, wood, and rusted steel peel off the curved sides, plunging in my wake. And perched right atop the failing edge is the creature, skeletal arms grabbing at the crumbling footholds. For one split second, our eyes meet in unified shock at the reversal. It's my turn to gaze down while it struggles. With a final wrenching groan, the tunnel mouth gives way completely, plunging beast and debris together into the devouring dark. Their deafening descent reverberates off the walls, framing my motionless form, still frozen against the pounding air gusts. I cling numb to jutting metal brackets, ears straining for long moments until the last echoes fade away. Only void answers back up from the tomb-like depths. My pulse gradually resumes, equal parts disbelief and all-consuming relief. Twisting my neck upwards, I fix desperate eyes on the glorious glow, beckoning me onwards. Mustering the very last strength in my aching limbs, I begin dragging myself by fingertips and boot tips up the iron ladder. Twenty agonizing feet from the surface, a snap of rubble across concrete drifts up the ventilation shaft. My heart seizes once more. Putting my shoulder to the crumbling ladder frames, I climb upwards as fast as I can. The scrape of claws accelerates deafening up the concrete, amplified to an unbearable nightmare by the vent. Shards of broken boards and dangling cords whip my arms and face as I frantically climb. Then finally I reach the top. I throw my weight against the manhole cover in an effort to close it back up, metal edges screeching, refusing to align. Desperation forces the corroded seal centimeter by centimeter over the gap. But the last sliver still remains open when the creature heaves up against the underside. All my weight and effort remain insufficient to keep this hellgate closed. In a final gamble, I wedge a broken plank scavenged from the debris between the steel hatch and crumbling stonework. For three seconds, the wood slat groans, yet holds, pinning back the jagged limb worming into the light. The creature thrashes rabidly against it. Not wasting precious seconds, I abandon the hole and bolt on trembling legs into daylight. Safely back inside my house, I collapsed onto the worn living room couch, struggling to catch my breath after the terrifying ordeal. My heart pounded against my ribs as my mind replayed the nightmarish images over and over, the haunting, inhuman shrieks echoing through the concrete tunnels, the pale, malformed creature bursting from the darkness, and all those endless moments spent blindly running through the pitch-black bunker. I shuddered, incredibly grateful to have somehow escaped that underground lair and the unfathomable predator dwelling within.
Glancing around my familiar, comforting house, the warm sunlight, now streaming through the windows, seemed to mock the fresh visions of horror still lurking below in the woods. As the adrenaline rush began fading, the various scrapes and bruises sustained during my frantic escape started to register. Making my way to the bathroom, I winced at the swelling ankle and crusted blood from multiple nasty gashes. I gingerly peeled off my shredded pants to clean the dirt from my wounds. Kneeling down, shock coursed through me as I stared at the tattered skin surrounding my ankle. The normally red, inflamed scratches appeared coated in an ominous dark substance. As I watched, thin veins of inky blackness seemed to spread slowly up my leg from the wound. Icy fear constricted my chest. The creature had touched me somehow during the chase. Could its claws or skin have transferred some kind of poison or parasite into me? The dark veins branching under my skin certainly seemed to suggest something now coursed through my bloodstream. Panic rising, I knew I needed medical help. I scrambled up and limped urgently to the kitchen counter across the hall where my cell phone waited. Snatching it up with a desperate prayer, my brief hope vanished. The phone screen was completely shattered, probably from being dropped or thrown against concrete during my blind escape. Worthless now, I slammed the dead device down. Feeling isolated and afraid, I peered out the back window, still able to glimpse the leaf-strewn grass, hiding that fateful tunnel entrance. If that creature somehow tracked me back here, that entrance would surely be its first point of attack. Inspiration hit suddenly. I could try barricading the tunnel, blocking the path from its lair. That might at least delay the horror reaching me should it pursue my scent trail. Ignoring the now consistent dizzy spells, I rummaged through the garage and yard shed, collecting any spare planks, boxes, and tools that might work to seal the tunnel. Dragging them awkwardly around the side of the house to the woods, I started desperately piling debris over the crumbling hole. But with my body growing weaker by the minute, even the smaller logs required leaning my whole body into moving across the grass. I awkwardly lined up each plank, nailing it haphazardly to its neighbor. The matrix of boards slowly formed a makeshift seal over the entrance. My hammering pulses echoed through the woods until a loud snap interrupted me. I stopped, listening intently past my own ragged breaths. The snap repeated, followed by an earthy, crunching drawing nearer. Tree limbs rustled violently off to my left. I peered desperately between the shadowy trunks, but already knew in my pounding heart nothing natural moved with such crashing force or speed from the basement's direction. Judging by the volume increasing each second, my barricade would be utterly insignificant against the power barreling through the forest straight toward me. I abandoned the ineffective barrier and fled on wobbling legs back inside, scooping up the biggest kitchen knife as my sole remaining protection. Though still racked with confusion over how to possibly defend myself, some primal compulsion demanded action to brace against attack rather than paralyzing passivity. More deafening destruction erupted from the rear rooms. The creature had reached the house and was smashing violently up through the splintering floorboards. Heart lurching into my throat, I scraped aside living room furniture with hysterical urgency, piling the meager barricade against the doorway connecting to the kitchen. But the feeble lamps and chairs proved even more pitiful resistance. The makeshift blockade exploded apart. I retreated against the farthest wall in overwhelmed disbelief, clutching my cleaver in trembling hands. The beast would rip through that portal in mere seconds now. The creature ripped open the splintered basement door with a final enraged bellow, crashing into the debris-strewn room towards me faster than I could react in my rapidly weakening state. Its limbs swiped the feeble kitchen knife from my hands before bony claws could pierce my chest. I cried out as those jagged talons dug into my shoulders, and instantly, numbness spread down my torso. More of the inky toxin clearly now flooded into me from fresh wounds. My vision started dimming at the edges. I struggled to remain conscious, staring directly into the creature's face. Where eyes should have resided on any natural beast, this horror boasted only smooth, blank flesh peppered with scarred tissue. Revulsion and resignation churned within me as I accepted this thing crafted from nightmares would be my demise. Just then, a blinding spotlight blazed through the shattered window frames, causing the creature to recoil from my limp body with an ear-piercing screech. I heard my name frantically called out by multiple unfamiliar voices over the chaos. Blinking through the bright light flooding my house, I witnessed the creature scramble away from the powerful beams now sweeping the room. 
Heavy footsteps stomped onto the splintered floorboards as dozens of figures in full military gear rapidly stormed into the house. They barked urgent commands I could barely comprehend, splitting into teams with weapons drawn advancing in textbook clearance maneuvers. The creature attempted to bolt for the basement exit only to meet crackling electric restraints that dropped it to the ground instantly. More soldiers moved in, entangling it completely within electrified nets. My adrenaline drained fully away watching the hulking beast smothered and immobilized by the precisely coordinated squad. Soon, no signs of that otherworldly strength remained, only muffled whimpers echoing from within the layered containment. A fully armored trooper knelt beside me, carefully drawing infected blood samples from my neck as another field medic began disinfecting the myriad claw wounds searing my shoulders. Their voices sounded oddly muffled between my fading consciousness and the helmets masking all facial features. Morphine entered my veins swiftly, dragging my mind below the pain and alarm temporarily. Eventually, I awoke hours, maybe days later, in a sterile medical isolation chamber. Various tubes fed into my arm from hanging IV bags containing liquids in unnaturally vivid hues. Thick pain glass surrounded the hospital bed on all sides, preventing any contact with whoever observed me through the opaque surface. Attempting to rise sent the room into dizzying spins, so I collapsed back. Some unknown stretch of time later, my dull senses perceived the sealed door sliding open. A tall man entered wearing an unmarked black suit, surveying me for a silent moment before speaking. You've been unconscious for two days after we extracted you from the specimen's attack. No doubt you are feeling quite bewildered about all this. He curtly explained I had suffered substantial blood toxicity from the escaped specimen's claws. However, emergency teams responded fast enough to administer monoclonal antibodies after extracting me once a distress signal was triggered. That unapproved experiment was an aging Cold War biochemical weapon we, unfortunately, revitalized despite its pending humane termination. But thanks to your inadvertent discovery facilitating its recapture, our cleanup responsibility has concluded, he said, keeping his eyes trained on me. In exchange for my full non-disclosure, the shadow agent continued while producing a medical document for signature. Their division would provide ample financial compensation both for undergoing hazardous environmental exposure and to discourage any public speculation over conspiracy theories. If you sign this non-disclosure agreement, our division will compensate you substantially for this ordeal and ensure you avoid any uncomfortable scrutiny over speculating on such matters publicly. He concluded by congratulating my lucky survival before a medical team transported me quietly to finish convalescing at a remote department facility. You ought to be proud of surviving such an encounter. Very few live to tell about it, and none who do, of course. We will get you patched up nicely somewhere more quiet before sending you home with a nice token of thanks, he said. In the following weeks, under constant supervision, my physical recovery progressed smoothly while psychological adaptation went less so. The layers of confidentiality agreements signed before discharge brought some financial security, but little true closure. Officials remained vague regarding the creature's fate, only repeating assurances of it being contained under specialized conditions no longer my concern. The evening an unmarked truck dumped me outside my little country house again. I harbored no doubts the nondescript sedan parked down the road contained surveillance members charting my conformity for some clandestine file. The house itself revealed no traces indicating government breach or creature intrusion after losing consciousness that horrific night. No local friends or family ever received the full story of what transpired beneath our rural community thanks to binding contracts. For the residents of this peaceful small town will sleep soundly tonight, as they have for decades prior, entirely oblivious to the machine operating within the shadows tasked with occasionally confronting nightmares distilled into reality or dispensing amnesia to preserve the greater illusion should such things slip their cage.